hello and welcome everyone. We'll just uh, give it a couple more seconds for the last attendees to join in for this evening. But first of all, thank you very much for joining us all. Um, this is our third uh, uh, large webinar in the Heidelberg series um, in the past few months. Um, my name is Tim Cole. I'm joined this evening by um, Emily Malburn from the Heidelberg Academy team. She's the manager of the Academy team. Uh, Mark Holloway and Fard Q Hill as well. Um, so the webinar session this evening is called OCT in Primary Care, What, When, How? Um, so what we're going to do in this webinar is really it's going to be driven by Mark and Fard. They're <coughs> going to talk about um, some different cases together and I'll, I'll discuss with you um, exactly how that's going to go. So just go to the next slide. So here we have the agenda. So the patient history and examination primary care, as I just mentioned, this is what uh, Mark is going to do to begin with. He's going to talk about some of his patients. Mark, I should add, is an optometrist from Dronfield and Fard Hill is an ophthalmologist in, at uh, Sheffield Hallamshire Hospital. So Mark's going to talk about his patients and how OCT has helped him in the examination with these primary care patients. And then Fard is going to add his comments to that as well. The second part of, of the story of the process is going to, they're going to talk about the pathway as these patients come through primary care and into secondary care. So from Mark's care to Fard's care, they're going to have a nice uh, chit chat backwards and forwards discussion about how that works, followed by a Q&A session at the end. And just for your information, as I'm sure you all know, we logged on to this, uh, this webinar this, this evening, it's worth one interactive CET point. So if you're new to um, GoToWebinar, have a look at the menu bar on the side of your screen. Here's the place where you can type us questions throughout the webinar this evening. You can raise your hand if you have anything urgent, but really probably the best way to get in touch with us is just type a message on that little questions tab. And you can see um, on the desktop, the iPad, or if you even joined in with a mobile phone, it's very easy to do so. You just press the question mark button and type away whatever you want. So in the background, myself and Emily will be able to hopefully answer most of your questions, but then at the end, we'll save the really good ones for Mark and Far to, to discuss as well. So just a bit more of a, a formal introduction. As I said, Mark is an optometrist. He owns uh, Thomas and Holloway Opticians in Dronfield. And Mr. Fard Q uh, Hill is the consultant ophthalmologist at the Royal Hallandshire Hospital. This uh, lovely photograph here is one that Fard gave me. It's a, a local uh, beauty spot he goes to, just uh, in his area on, in the border of South Yorkshire near Derby. And it's just a nice uh, viewpoint from Sheffield. So this is where both Mark and Fard reside and, and basically provide their excellent care. So I'm going to leave you now in the capable hands of Mark. And as I said, he's going to go through some cases and then Fard will chip in in between the different cases. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Right. Good evening, all. Um, as Tim said, my name's Mark Holloway. I'm an independent optometrist based in Drumfield. Um, I took over the family business around about eight years ago and we introduced OCT relatively early -ish adopter. We got our spectralis in 2014. Um, since then, I've done the College of uh, Optometrist Professional Certs in MedRet and, and Glaucoma to sort of hopefully um, crystallise and solidify the excellent learning that I initially had from Heidelberg themselves. Um, this evening, what I'm going to try and do is I've chosen seven patients, uh, seven of my own patients that um, we've worked up a brief history on. And then we're going to have a look at some scans. I'm going to um, try and, well, I'm going to explain my differential diagnosis and what I, the next steps that I did, and then I'm going to hand over to Fard. Um, this is the fifth webinar that I've done with Heidelberg, but it's the first one where I've actually sat in front of however many people are listening. I asked them not to tell me and then had my decisions um, live analysed by a consultant ophthalmologist. So uh, my fingers are crossed that I haven't got any of this drastically wrong. Um, right, let's uh, crack on with the first case. So. A brief background. First case, this is a, a fairly long standing uh, patient, female, 87 years old. She's attended for a sight test and a scan 
uh, routine really sort of no change visions aren't great 624 minus in the right she's only count fingers in the left a non-clinical um, examination um, bulk assessment uh, we've got extensive extensive drusen uh, right and left remember that this lady's routine she's asymptomatic she's no change when we have a look at the um, the images here um, these are OCT uh, cross-sectional scans and infrared images so what we can see here basically is is areas of um, hyperreflectivity so some, some some lighter areas there's some small areas of hyperreflectivity we've got lots of show through the retina where the the retina is thinned and so the the uh, the scanning light is is, is 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 progressing through the retina as well as looking at your b scan it's really important to also look at the infrared image as well because the infrared image does contain a lot of a lot of information and you, it's not a fundus photo but it's a pretty good black and white proxy of one um and this is the horizontal cross section high resolution scan right through the uh, right through the mac right through the macula um, this is obviously dry macular degeneration. The top image there, uh, so a very, very common presentation. This is probably more advanced than many dry AM AMDs that you may have walking through your door, but it's by no means the worst that you're going to see. Now, in this particular case, um, the, these two scans, by the way, are separated. The top scan is from July of last year. The bottom scan is from January of this year. So this patient is is uh, is attending fairly regularly for scans, mainly for peace of mind. She's already uh, registered as being sight impaired. There's no change in the RX, no change in the prescription, and there's not really any change in um, in uh, the the state on the on the OCT or the clinical examinations. There's also no evidence of progression to wet, so we've got no suspect uh, CNV or uh, or subretinal fluids. Um, and in this case, the decision was taken with the patient, and she actually also attends every time with her daughter, to just continue to monitor fairly regularly every three months at basically the patient's request for peace of mind and reassurance. She loves the reassurance of what coming to see me and having the scan does. She likes to see in as much as she can the fact that the pictures look the same as they did the last time, and that gives her a great deal of reassurance. So in this particular instance, it wasn't a referral, but Bard, what would be your sort of thoughts on when you would want to see this patient? When would it be appropriate to refer a dry AMD? So, first of all, I'd like to support your approach on this particular patient. You've got access to really high quality OCT imaging. You've got the patient in front of, me, front of you. You're able to record the vision and you're able to advise. And you've got the skill set that an ophthalmologist doesn't have. Ophthalmologists, we don't refract. We don't prescribe glasses as good as you guys and we're not very good in giving the low vision aids. So in my own service, I'm referring patients, but actually I'm referring them to trained optometrists, trained orthoptists. And if you can deal with this in-house, that's gotta be better for the patient because then they've been managed at their doorstep and also you're not overwhelming the hospital service with unnecessary patients. But when you should refer the patient, if low vision services are required and you as an optometrist don't feel you have the skill set and the ability and the expertise to guide that patient well, then I think it's reasonable to refer routinely. If the patient's vision is affected significantly that you feel they would be eligible for partial sight or blind registration, then unfortunately here in the UK, we still require a consultant ophthalmologist to sign that form. So again, you need to refer that patient into hospital. But most importantly, if you suspect wet age-related macular degeneration, either from your clinical examination, from the history the patient has given you, or there are signs on the OCT that makes us suspect that, then I think it's important that you still refer that patient to the hospitalized service. And obviously, um, I, I put facts on this particular slide, but I think now it's probably an email or another method of referral, but you should access the Fast Track AMD clinic. And, I would like to just reinforce to the audience, yes, you want to use OCT to discriminate between your wet and dry, but if there's anything on the clinical examination or anything in the history that makes you concerned, uh, don't hesitate to refer that patient to the local eye service. Yeah, thanks, Father. I think um, being on the border between um, sort of like South Yorkshire and North Derbyshire, 
Um, I would say that probably 75, 80 percent of my patients head towards Chesterfield Royal Hospital. 20 percent might head over to your hospital over at the Hallamshire. And I think it's important for everybody listening. I think that the the fast track schemes are very widely available now. And I think it's important for people to understand what the protocols are, because it is a different protocol referring into Sheffield compared to referring into Chesterfield. Um, the the, the the overall effect is the same, but it's a slightly different pathway to get in there. So all I would recommend to people with this is to make sure that they're aware of what their fast track uh, routes are into the hospitals, when they're available, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, but okay. just want to reinforce to the audience to take your approach. And if they're happy and they're comfortable, this is dry age related macular degeneration. You know, we don't need to refer that into hospital. You know, GPs are referring every patient with osteoarthritis to an orthopedic surgeon and our optometry colleagues shouldn't identify, should, shouldn't be referring every age-related change that they see to the hospital service. Yeah. It's about making the judgment if it's in the best interest of the patient. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would say that the vast majority of my colleagues locally are very familiar with, with that. Unfortunately, dry macular degeneration is incredibly common and, and something that we're all coming across you know, on a daily basis, probably multiple times daily, perhaps not to this degree, but, uh, you know, certainly early dry macular changes are, are very, very common um, in, in primary care practices. Uh, let's move on to uh, to patient two then. So um, this is a, a male patient. It's a new patient, actually. Um, male, 89 years old. Um, again, visions are pretty poor, 638 minus right, 624 plus in the left. Patients attended complaining of reduced vision, more near vision than distance vision. Um, when we do, or when I did the uh, Volk assessment and, and, and clinical examination, there was evidence of central hemorrhage in the right eye, and in the left eye, there was evidence of drusen and pigmentary change. When we um, sort of back that up with the, um, the OCT scans, um, again, what we can see here, the top scan here is a, a cross-section scan through the right eye. The bottom scan is obviously a cross-sectional scan through the left eye. Um, what we can see in the top top scan is an area of hyper-reflectivity, so areas that appear brighter, and hypo-reflective area, which appear darker. Um, that's on the right eye. In, and again, on the image, you can sort of make out where the, the hemorrhage problem was uh, with this area that I'm sort of highlighting with my, uh, with my pointer. Hopefully, you can see that okay there. Um, on the on the left eye image, we've got um, evidence of hyperreflective areas, um, drusen, dry, more dry macular change. But certainly, in terms of the scans, the, um, the the priority was really this right eye. This in this region here, this hyperreflective uh, area is suspect uh, subretinal fluid. And I've always been taught and led to believe that subretinal fluid um, should be suspected wet AMD until proven otherwise. And certainly with sudden onset symptom, relatively sudden onset symptoms, the VA um, and the, the both the clinical and the OCT uh, images, um, this is a suspect wet AMD in the right, dry AMD in the left. This patient was emailed with images via the local um, Chesterfield Royal Hospital Fast Track, which actually involves us sending an email via nhs.net email with a basic um, sort of covering couple of sentences, prescription VAs, patient contact details, and then scan images attached if we've got them for them to be able to uh, triage and, and arrange appointments accordingly. So again, um, what, what would your thoughts be with this one? What, what would happen with this patient had I have sent them in the opposite direction and sent them over to, to you guys in Sheffield? So we would have um, read your GOS18 GOS form, looked at the scans and recognized this is a wet AMD um, you're absolutely right. Anybody with subretinal fluid or intraretinal fluid that's not explained in the context of age-related changes, we've got to suspect wet AMD. The patient would probably would have been seen that week. So we normally see our new AMD patient sorry, on a Friday uh, morning and they will get a vision. They'll get an OCT and now they'll get an OCT angiogram. So an OCT angiogram is basically still using the spectralis machine, but you're taking many more scans and it's manipulating those scans to identify abnormal vascular flow. If you have clinical examination and an OCT and OCTA suggestive of wet AMD, then that patient would be listed directly 
for an intravitreal injection the following Monday. So within two days, we give them a couple of days just to kind of um, uh, chew over the news, the bad news that we've given them and some of the information about kind of the intensity of treatments that they will need to get the best outcome with anti-VEGF injections. If the OCTA is inconclusive, then we'll also on that Friday morning do an intravenous fluorescein angiogram because we really want to be clear that this is wet AMD because we're likely to put a patient on a course of treatment that can last anything between two to four to five years. Um, but that's what would happen in, in Sheffield. Um, but I think, uh, and thank you for sharing this slide, just to kind of reinforce the point which we made earlier, if you suspect wet AMD, which can be the history, clinical examination, so you identify subretinal hemorrhage or features on the OCT that makes you suspect it, so intraretinal fluid or subretinal fluid in the context of age-related uh, changes, then do refer that patient to an ophthalmologist immediately. And as Mark said, be very familiar with the local protocols. And if you can send some high quality scans, preferably electronically, that's really helpful because it gives us an idea and it enables us to triage because sometimes we can identify that it may be something else that's masquerading uh, as wet AMD. We may not have to see that patient as urgently, um, but nevertheless, from your perspective, if you suspect it's wet AMD, whether you're right or wrong, refer that patient, do what's in the best interest of that patient. And what would you want us to be telling the patients, Fard? Would you want us to be telling them sort of what to expect when they come or would you rather handle that yourself when they arrive? You know what? That's a really, really good question. I mean, sometimes you don't, you don't want to be giving a patient bad news if you're wrong. But at the same time, if you don't make it clear to them what you're worried about, then they may ignore hospital review. A bit of a side, but I remember examining a two-year-old child in casualty in Birmingham when I trained, and I'd identified a retinoblastoma, an eye cancer, and the parents had sat on this leukocoria for two to three months. I wasn't sure whether I was right or wrong, I discussed it with the ophthalmologist and I said, what shall I tell the child's parents? He said, tell them what you're worried about. It meant that that child went to hospital that Monday and got the treatment that they need. Now, AMD is not the same as retinoblastoma. You could counsel the patient saying, look, I might be wrong, but this is what I'm worried about. Because I think if you don't have that conversation, that patient could be falsely reassured and then may not engage with the hospital service, or if they do engage, they'll engage in a delayed way and then they don't get the treatment in a timely fashion. But the, bad, the, the downside with breaking that bad news is that you can cause anxiety, but maybe better some, some short-term anxiety and then relief in the hospital if you're on the right part, if, if, if you're misdiagnosed, but if you've correctly diagnosed, you've managed to get that patient into that service more quickly. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I tend to, um, give the bad news but counsel and say look I'm not an ophthalmologist I can't give you a final diagnosis I'm referring based on worst case scenario we can hope that it isn't this but if it is particularly in the case of what AMD it is something that's manageable it is something that's treatable and therefore it's definitely worth acting quickly on this and hopefully again that will mean that a patient doesn't go home and and sit for a fortnight thinking whether they should go to the appointment that's actually been arranged for that afternoon or the following day so I, and I think it's a really good point. And I think having that discussion with the patient, being very clear about what you're worried about is very helpful just because I have seen the situation where the optician hasn't been very clear. Uh, and that can be bad I, I, as well because the patient's very anxious. They think there's something more serious or they just don't engage at all. So, you know, it's using another analogy in the screening program, if you didn't, if we, we always insist on seeing these patients in hospital if they have referable retinopathy. We never wanted to manage them in the community. And one of the reasons is because we wanted the patient to wake up to think, I'm having to go to hospital, therefore there must be something serious about my eye, there must be an issue that I need to engage with. Um, there's good and bad, and there's rights and wrongs, but I think in total, I think what you've suggested is the right thing and is in the best interest of the patient. Okay, fantastic. Um, we may well get questions uh, questions on that subject at the end, but uh, we'll move on to uh, to scenario three or patient three now. Um, again, um, this is a male patient, long-standing patient, um, aware of change, 
um, but left eye felt change was more than the right eye. In this case, the right VA is, is 612. Now, this is the <clears throat> this is the OCT image. Um, I, I've purposely only showed the right eye image on this one because of what I'm what we're trying to get across here. The left eye looked very, very similar to the previous case's right eye. There was definite wet AMD there. Um, what I have looked at with this one is suspecting uh, the teleform change in the right eye. Now, despite the fact that I've had OCT for since 2014, so coming up six years, um, I do find the teleform maculopathy on paper should be relatively easy to monitor or, or manage or, or certainly differentially diagnose but in practice i find it incredibly difficult and while i was trying to find patients to talk about on this on this webinar this evening i actually came across three or four a couple of which who between me taking an initial scan and and and, and, and digging the patient file out had actually progressed to wet amd and i think through the purpose of this i've probably got more nervous about managing um suspect the telephone changes than perhaps more so but th this right eye to me does seem like a, uh, a, a telephone change what we can see here for everybody looking um, th on the infrared image we can see that there's quite a lot of drusen now it's kind of a patch drusen which to my mind would probably be uh, in line with more of the reticular type drusen pattern and you can see some jagged sawtooth just a little bit in this area of the, of the retina just here more centrally though what we've got is this domed um, hypo-reflective or, or a, a, in, in the central retina there's a domed hypo-reflective lesion which is consistent with the vitelliform or, or egg-like yolk-like appearance they can be quite difficult in my opinion when they're subtle to see clinically with a with a with a, with a Volk lens now I did actually refer this gentleman but I'll be honest it was more for the changes that were in his in his left eye um, rather than the right eye um, he did have confirmed wet AMD in the left eye and I haven't been able to follow him up with scans because the, uh, the hospital have, have taken that over and the patient did, doesn't either need or want me to do the scans because he's obviously having them under the hospital environment. But um, yeah, what are your thoughts on the telephone change? I, I know it's, a, it's not an e possibly an easy one, this is certainly not for me anyway. I, I think this is a difficult, a, a tricky case um, and w with pitfalls. You know, the million dollar question is when is a hyperreflective lesion something you need to worry about and, where, and when do you need to refer that patient? And a lot of it is down to your skill as an optometrist. It's really important to take a good history. Did that patient come to you complaining of distortion? Did they complain of a blind spot in the vision? If they did, then that hyperreflective lesion that you've shown me could be a myopic crawling vascular membrane, could be a form of wet AMD that it just hasn't leaked very much, so there isn't enough subretinal fluid. So what you've got to realize, why do you get subretinal fluid or intraretinal fluid? Is because the amount of fluid that that abnormal network of blood vessels <clears throat> has been so significant that it's overwhelmed the ability of the retinal pigment epithelium to keep the retina dry. But if it doesn't leak very much, you may not get very much leakage, but it's a hyperreflective lesion that you need to worry about that could degenerate vision. You know, what was the AMSA chart? What was the vision six months before? Uh, so it's all taking, what was clinical examination? Was there subretinal hemorrhage? Were there other ex, subretinal exudation? Were there features that made you concerned that there could be an exudative process? If you said to me this was an incidental finding in an asymptomatic patient, then you might be relaxed. But I wouldn't be too relaxed. I'd probably still monitor that patient, possibly arrange a follow-up OCT scan, possibly ask them to self-monitor with an AMSA chart, to monitor the distortion against um, a door frame or a windowsill. But if they're symptomatic or they've had declining vision, then I probably would still refer. Or if you're just unsure, you have to be do what's in your patient's best interest, know your limitations as a practitioner, and refer that to the, to the expert. Um, I, as an ophthalmologist, know my limitations. So when I, when I, when I come across something where I'm unsure, I will refer to the appropriate person because that's in the patient's best interest. But I think this is an excellent case because this could be hyperreflective lesion, which we don't need to worry about. And I think if, it's, if the patient is asymptomatic and the clinical examination is normal and the vision is good, you could probably watch but with those caveats of follow-up OCT scan and counting the patient to self-monitor, 
But if there's symptoms, this could actually be a CMVM that's yeah. just not leaking very much. You do a fluorescein and you'll find there's masses of hyperfluorescence. Yeah. I think, uh, fortunately for me, unfortunately for the patient, my get out of jail in this particular case was the fact that the left eye was 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 far more progressed or worse, and therefore the patient was going to be seen and worked up anyway. So I mentioned this right eye suspect the teleform change, but would appreciate second opinion. But it was very much secondary to what was going on in in the fellow eye, because that that was that was certainly the priority. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with the symptoms. I, I, sometimes I've referred patients who complain of sudden onset central distortion with positive Amsler changes and, 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 and positive central scotomas, even if I don't see a great deal on an OCT scan, because, you know, I, I can remember when I first had my OCT, um, Chris Modi, who at the time was, was, was doing the training on behalf of Heidelberg, was, was very much, you know, don't forget your clinical uh, use clinical skill set. The OCT is an amazing bit of kit, but it doesn't necessarily have every single answer. And if you didn't have an OCT, what would you do with a patient with sudden onset, positive central sc scotoma and distortion on Amsler? Well, you'd refer them. And just because you don't see fluid or you don't see uh, um, a CNV on an OCT, I would probably still refer that patient. You probably don't get them very often, but, you know, don't forget your clinical workup, as, as you've said. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I, I think OCT has revolutionized, revolutionized our ability to diagnose and monitor macular disease, but at the same time, don't forget your, what you've been trained, um, all your training and all that expertise you have in history taking and ocular examination. Yeah, fan fantastic. Right, let's move on to patient four. So. Um, this is a, a, a male patient, now 70 years old. He's a long-standing patient. Um, his left eye, his right eye is 6'5", so the VA is extremely good. The left eye is no perception of light. Um, he had a central retinal vein occlusion um, many years ago, and the left eye, had I have shown you, the images looks like the barren surface of the moon. Um, so he's very, very, very totally dependent upon uh, what he's got with his right eye. Um, he was he was one of the very first patients probably within the first 10 or 15 patients that i put on the oct and this is what we got um so this this image is ta was taken in 2014 and what we can see here is a on the surface of the uh, on the infrared scan you can see this sort of brown uh, sorry dark shadowy area um what we then can see underneath there is that the retina is domed and there's this fairly large um hypo uh, reflective um, reflective dome. Um, I was. Um, it's within the within the arcades. We're also only talking what a disc diameter at the edge of which is only a disc maximum two disc diameters away from the fovea. He's six five in this eye, asymptomatic, but it's not far away from from the danger zone, and he doesn't have a full back eye. Now, because of all of those uh, points, I actually referred this gentleman in. Um, to the hospital eye service, and um, when I when I I thought this would be a good one to uh, to actually use because I actually have a I actually refer this patient into the hospital, and I have a letter back from yourself from the Hallam <laughs> telling me what to do with this patient. So oh gosh, I, yeah, yeah. So I saw I saw him in practice, and because of all of the factors just said, despite the fact that he was six five and asymptomatic, I sent this patient in. Not necessarily because I expected you to do anything with it, but because I wanted to know when you would want to see him and what risk factors we needed to look out for. And um, just for, sorry, I've glossed over the fact that what we're looking at here, uh, or my differential diagnosis on the referral was, was a posterior epithelial detachment, um, relatively common finding, um, often not quite as big as this. They can come and go, often they're a bit smaller, this one you can see the doming on the surface of the retina with a volk when you know where to look at and, and you look hard but the small peds and we've got a tiny incidental one coming up in a in a in a, in a later case study uh, very very difficult for me anyway to see uh, clinically i i asked for some information some feedback on this and you wrote back to me and said um send this gentleman back to me if he becomes a symptomatic b there's a va decline or C, if the fovea is, is affected. Now, I'm now monitoring this patient every six months. The patient is quite 
if you like, nervous, but getting more relaxed with time about the fact that this is his only good eye. He's well engaged with the healthcare and he's well engaged with me. He knows he can contact me at any point if there's any change. Um, so during 2000, since 2014, we've done multiple scans. So the top scan there is the one from 2014. The bottom scan is the one is the one that I did last towards the end of 2019. Unfortunately, COVID has meant that he's slightly delayed on a, on a follow up, but um, I've no doubt he would have been in touch had there been any change. Um, I think for me, what this case shows is the beauty of the active eye tracking that comes with the Spectralis unit um, and the quality of the images, because we, I know and the patient knows probably more importantly that we've got high levels of repeatability. We know that we're looking at the same area of the scan. Obviously, we're only looking at one infrared image and one B scan here, but there's a whole suite of scans going down across this and you can put pin the two together, run them as a movie, see if there is any difference and change between the two scans. The size of the PED waxes and wanes a little bit. As you can see, there is a slight difference between top and bottom, but it's not fulfilling any of the re-referral criteria. Um, I'm happy, probably more impatient, more important, the patient is happy and reassured. And therefore, the decision on in this particular instance is just to continue to monitor um, with the advice that, that you gave me in written form. This is an excellent case. And, you know, thank you for, because I've forgotten about it, I do apologise. So thank you for reminding me. This is kind of the ideal, this, this, this joint working between ho the hospitalised service and community optometrists where we can diagnose, but if we have highly skilled optometrists in the community with the relevant equipment, equipment that can actually safely monitor this patient in the community, in their locality, and only refer the patient back when you think uh, an ophthalmologist needs to intervene. Um, I mean, I still think how you played it or how you dealt with it at the beginning was probably correct. So this patient had a solitary PED in his only eye with no obvious reason. I think it needs to have a medical retina opinion. Yeah. However, if the communication between hospitalized service and community optometry were to improve, and with, particularly with the, if we have better networking, this could be something that could be monitored by, seen by you, where you give the ophthalmologist a lot of data, they can assess it remotely and give you advice about how to monitor the patient because at the end of the day, irrespective of what the cause is, if we're not going to treat it, why do we have to necessarily see the patient? Mm -hmm. At the moment, I would say because that two-way communication isn't there, you've got, I would always advise to anybody in the, in, in the audience is to do what's in the patient's best interest. You, you may not have a good working relationship with your local eye department or the patient may not be able to come for regular OCT reviews at their local optician. So it may be better or prudent to refer them uh, to hospital. Um, but in, terms of, in this particular case, this is a solitary PED with good vision, we're in a quiet eye, and probably in somebody who's age-related, this is probably an age-related um, pigment epithelial detachment. And as you've shown, it's been very stable over many, many years and it's been managed very well between ourselves. Yeah, fantastic. I think there's lots of talk in it. I mean, it's a whole separate webinar, webinar or discussion about uh, the positive, uh, potential positive outcomes of COVID. But um, I think there's a lot of chatter when I speak to people that hopefully when we come out of COVID, the fact that we've been forced into having better communication channels between the hospital eye service and primary care, that hopefully those channels of communications continue and continue to improve and that we don't just go back to the uh, send a letter, hope the hospital get it and never hear anything until the, the patient comes back. Um, because, you know, lots of people in primary care that I speak to are quite happy to take the weight off the hospital and, and do some management and monitoring, possibly not management, but certainly monitoring of patients as long as we've got some fairly good criteria to work to. So and I, I'm really happy to do this. And probably most importantly, the, the most important person in this equation is the patient. The patient is, yeah. is very happy to come into primary care. He can easily park. He can get in. OK, it costs him a few pounds to get it done, but he knows he's in and out within 20, 30 minutes, um, completely reassured. And he, he hasn't got the, you know, the anxiety of a hospital visit and the, the time and things like that. So, yeah, 
long may this uh, this better work better working together continue as far as I'm concerned anyway here here right so let's move on to patient five I'm uh, conscious of time um want to leave time for questions patient five um this is a male 76 years old routine sight test slight decrease found in the VA uh, right eye more so than left eye right eye is now six nine minus was probably six seven five previously there's also some early lens changes at 76 we've got some earlier uh, nuclear cataract when we look at the OCT slice and again I've purposely only just chosen um, one slice um, what we can see on this one is 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 epiretinal membrane and this this is incredibly common um, certainly there's a lot more epiretinal membrane since I've had an OCT I suspect that's just because I'm finding more of them um, particularly subtle ones not always easy to see on on uh, you know clinically um, I tend to have just written shimmer to retina query ERM but if the if the um, if the VA is good and that they're asymptomatic I've left it at that with the advent of OCT obviously we can now see these things so I don't think it's the game more common I just think we're seeing them more because we're able to what we can see here is a hyper reflective band across the top of the retina that's the epiretinal membrane we can see some evidence of um, irregularity to the surface of the retina we can also see some irregularity to the lower retina down in this area just here and that's consistent where this sort of like leopard print patterning is which again, correct me if I'm wrong, Fard is, is probably consistent with with uh, reticular type drusen. If you look very no, closely, if you look very closely at the image, one of the great things about uh, the infrared images, because of the way they work, is you can see the the sort of like striation marks, almost like the stretch marks on the surface of the retina, which even with just an just an infrared image would indicate or give you a much better idea of epiretinal membrane. And again, you can see that epiretinal membrane very very clearly here. Now, in this particular case, um, th this is actually my father-in-law. He won't mind you saying. He won't mind me saying rather. Um, and I've been monitoring his eyes fairly regularly on the OCT and clinically since we got the OCT and before. Um, but the epiretinal membrane is is looks. Um, I should really have put two slices in here before and then after. But the epiretinal membrane is incredibly stable. And therefore, my feeling and agreement with him was that the very slight VA decline was more likely related to um, a slight progression in the, in the nuclear cataract um, and not retinal. He was largely asymptomatic. We, it was a by the by finding of, of, um, of a slight VA decrease when we measured it on Snellen. Um, no reports of metamorphopsia, no, no positive Amsler reportings or anything like that. Now, given the fact that he's 6'9, uh, he didn't want to be referred for his cataract surgery at the moment. He felt he was doing absolutely fine, which, which is which is fine. That's his call. Um, the epiretinal membrane was stable. He's asymptomatic. The VA is within the sort of 618, 612 that I generally use as a guide, and he's asymptomatic. So I've just agreed to monitor um, with verbal advice to regularly check to monitor in sort of uh, probably six months' time unless he reports any change. Would you say that's um correct <laughs> i absolutely do you want to go to my next slide um yeah mark i absolutely agree so in the end what what is going to what is the patient going to gain from a referral uh, to a hospital you only really want to refer an epiretinal membrane if the patient is symptomatic they're aware of subjective distortion particularly with both eyes open or a visual disturbance or you've identified a clear vision decline over time that's having an impact, a meaningful impact on their activities of daily living. You refer a patient like your father-in-law, all I'm going to do as an ophthalmologist is confirm the epiretinal membrane, tell them that it's, it's mild, it isn't impacting on their quality of life, and explain the nature of the surgery and why that isn't a good idea and then probably refer them back to yourself, or I would see them after say six to nine months time, and if there was no progression, discharge them back to their care. And what you've done, you've brought them into hospital twice, they've waited in my clinic an hour, hour and a half, they've had to travel a fair distance, and in the end, actually they've, they've had no ophthalmic intervention. Yeah. Whilst if you see them as an optometrist, do a 
make sure you do a, a good VOLC. So they have to be dilated, but I do recommend that you examine the periphery of the fundus just to make sure there isn't a secondary lesion causing the upper endocrine membrane. Yeah. And then if you've done exactly that, like you say, you've taken a history, identified, is there an issue? Is this an incidental finding? And then if it is, say to them, look, I can monitor you and I'll give you some skills. I'll teach you how you can also self-monitor in the meantime. And then if there's any subjective or objective decline or progression in the OCT, at that point, we'll refer you to hospital. Now, the reality is that patient who's then referred after that period of observation may still not need treatment, but you've probably prevented 15 out of 20 epirental membranes being referred to hospital unnecessarily. Because I kind of quote a figure of a one in 20 chance of your epirental membrane progressing. And when they do, they kind of go, it happens very slowly. And what you want to do is refer them at the 6, 12, 6, 18 mark. You can refer them early at 6, 9, but that's when you've identified there is an issue or there's some evidence of decline or progression on an OCT. Okay. Yeah, and I think generally that's what I, and certainly speaking to, to local colleagues, uh, would, would probably do so at uh, at least we seem to be doing the uh, at least we seem to be doing the right things with those. The only other time that I may refer a patient like that would be if they were pushing for a referral and wanted a second sure. opinion. But that, to be perfectly honest, is probably more about me covering myself than any concern about the patient. Because just in case it did, it was the one that progressed, and I hadn't referred that nervous um, or you know pushy patient, if you like, uh, they're the ones who may be more likely to come back and uh, cause me some problems. But generally speaking, if they've if we've agreed and I've recorded that we've agreed agreed a plan and that the patients agreed to that plan, then yeah, I, I'm fairly relaxed about monitoring these and, and, until they get into into this sort of into this sort of situation. Um, That's a good point. Right, um, patient six. Now, patient six and seven are sort of like two sides of the same coin and you'll understand what I mean by that as we go through them. So this is a female 50 years old, routine sight test, right 6.5, left 6.5, ophthalmoscopy, um, no abnormalities detected. So, so far so good, happy days. Um, we do the OCT and this is what we get. So the top scan image here is from December 2019. This was the first time that we uh, picked this up on OCT. What can we see here? Well, we can see the posterior face posterior vitreous face here, which is detached. So we've got a partial PVD. Again, please jump in, Fard, if I'm uh, if I'm getting this wrong. But we've got a posterior a partial posterior vitreous detachment. But we've got some vitreomacular adhesion slash vitreomacular traction. So my understanding of those two is that vitreomacular adhesion is when you can see that the um, posterior vitreous face is adhered to the retina somewhere in this case and often the fovea because the binding is stronger it becomes vitreomacular traction when the sort of like dipped profile of the, of the foveal pit starts to become slightly deformed and um, what we could see in december 2019 is that that dip was ever so slightly deformed so there's some slight surface reflectivity changes some hypo reflective spots on the surface of the retina but just here we've got a tiny hypo sorry, hyper, and then this dark area, a very small hypo-reflective sort of like void. Now, my understanding of that, having seen a few of these, but please correct me if I'm wrong, is that that's probably just the retina very slightly delaminating as the vitreous is, is pulling up on it. Now, given the fact that the patient was asymptomatic in 6.5 and the patient was relatively relaxed about the situation because she was blissfully unaware of it and to be honest so would I have been if we hadn't have had OCT um, what we agreed was that I would follow her up pretty quickly I didn't want to let this one walk away um, to, and go too far so I saw her in December 2019 she then came back in the middle of January and we can see that there's a very slight change um, there but it's minimal she's still six she's still six five and we just agreed at that point to continue to monitor. Now I think, and I, I should probably have added a third one on, but when I put three scan lines on, it becomes very crowded. I think since then, this has now come off and the retina has, has kind of come back down and had, had it not been for OCT, she would have gone through this whole entire journey blissfully unaware. I did offer referral to this patient, but 
her question to me was, what will they do with me at the hospital? And I said, well, they'll probably just do exactly what I've done. They'll tell you exactly what I've told you because intervention through either ocroplasmin or um, vitrectomy is probably using a sledgehammer to crack a walnut in this case when you're 6'5", and the risk is that the VA is um, could come out of the, either of those treatments worse or cause secondary complications. Um, and therefore, you know, but I offered the referral and, and, and we made the joint decision to, 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 to monitor fairly closely in practice. Um, would you say I was right on that one, wrong on that one? Would you have done anything different with that? Would you have liked to see this lady? No, I wouldn't have done anything differently because she was asymptomatic. Because she was asymptomatic, this is an incidental finding. Yes, I agree with you. This is probably not just vitreo macular adhesion, but a mild form of vitreo macular attraction syndrome. And the best cure for vitreo macular attraction syndrome is actually observation and waiting for that hyaloid face to separate. I have patients with much worse changes than that who I've monitored. I have not offered any treatment to, and they've stayed 6566 six, six for the last two years, but with no improvement either. So these changes or configurations or, or changes in the retina can be very stable and have a, no impact on visual function. And then they're going to offer any operation. It's what are you trying to achieve and what are you trying to improve? Yeah. The only time I would refer a patient is if there was evidence of macular hole formation or there was severe subjective decline in vision, then you could refer those patients. And if they had a full thickness macular hole, I would probably offer them ocroplasmin first. And then if it cured it, well, then I've saved that patient an operation. And if they decline, then my VR colleagues would then do a full vitrectomy, but you've nicely separated the hyaloids for them. But if they have a severe form of vitreo macular attraction syndrome that hasn't progressed to macular hole, then I probably still wouldn't offer them treatment, but careful observation. And if there was a change and the symptoms were worsening, then I can offer ocroplasmin. But even ocroplasmin isn't the panacea. In, in about a third of my cases, it improves. And I, and I look like a, a hero. And then in a third of cases, I actually progress and they develop a full thickness macular hole. So then I have to rescue them with a vitreo retinal operation. So actually, vitreo macular tract syndrome, medical retina, or even VR specialists, we're not intervening straight away. We're observing. So really, we only want to see symptomatic patients, or like in epirenal membrane, where there's clear vision decline. And then I think you owe it to the patient, even if in your heart, you don't think the hospital will necessarily intervene straight away. But at least they're seeing an expert and somebody who has experience about when would be the right time to treat this patient? Yeah, and I, and I, yeah, I mean that this kind of nudges into the final case study. This this is sort of similar, uh, pretty good vision, no no uh, routine sight test, um, no symptoms on presentation. Fifty five years old, and we look at the OCT images. Now this is the same eye; it's a right eye. The top scan here is a vertical cross section. The the bottom scan is a horizontal cross section. This is probably more in line with the size of PED that I would normally see, but the PED wasn't necessarily the primary finding. What you've got in this vertical cross-section scan is, again, using my terminology, slight deformation. There's, there's, there's a slight elevation of the, uh, of the foveal profile, the foveal pit there, and you can just about make out the posterior hyaloid is, is attached. But in the horizontal cross-section, uh, it's difficult to see, but there is actually a hypo-reflective uh, sort of vertical column running right through the center of the macula, right, running right through the center of the fovea, and that VM, so the, the vitreo macular traction there is starting to pull through a hole. Now, despite the fact that this lady was uh, six six minus in both eyes, and obviously we're talking about the right eye here, she was also of a much more nervous disposition, and she was almost pushing without without stating it, asking me for a referral for a second opinion. Um, I don't take that personally. I am an optometrist, not an ophthalmologist. Um, and, and, and if people want second opinions, and I think that that's even at all called for, then I don't see myself as the gatekeeper and, and we'll do that, particularly in this case. So, yeah, th this is one of those whereby a knock, if you like, could pull a macular hole through that one. And I, I did feel that this one possibly was slightly more... Um, 
one for a, for somebody such as yourself to look at, Fard, and decide was ochroplasmin in, indicated in this one, given there is actually some change in the retinal architecture there? So looking at the bottom uh, picture, I agree that it's an odd configuration, and I, I wonder if over time that could progress into a, a macular hole. Unless the patient had severe symptoms, and particularly with both eyes open, it was interfering with their ability to read and so on and so forth, <coughs> then um, I, I might consider offering them ochroplasmin, but then there are caveats, and I discussed the risks, and I explained that it actually could um, uh, make the situation worse, and that they might need a full uh, vitrectomy. So ochroplasmin hasn't been the saving grace that we were hoping for it. But the, the, the other possibility is that I would just probably just closely observe and see that patient on a four to eight week to up to 12 week basis, depending on how things progress. As for that PED on the top, um, how old was that patient? Uh, she's 55. So do you think that could have been a CSR, maybe a bit, an early CSR, maybe, given that she was anxious? Or do you think it might have been an age related? It's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, difficult. I don't. I didn't have a before and after with this one. I think this was the only OCT that this lady had had at the time. Um, I've managed to crop the dates off as well, so I haven't still got the dates on this one. But maybe I'll go back uh, when I'm back in practice tomorrow morning and and have a look at the dates on this and see if there is a there is a follow up scan to have a look at. Um, but my my primary concern was was this sort of hypo -ref yeah. reflective sort of vertical column there. I, I think what actually happened with this one, and again, this is another point as well as knowing just a general point as well as knowing your um, local AMD fast tracks and, and, and triaging and things like that lots of hospitals are now putting together teleophthalmology programs and pilots and so these ones are great whereby you can actually send these high quality scans off for somebody such as yourself to look at with with the brief history with the bio with the VAs with the prescription and um, and, and then get that second opinion because had we have done, had I have done that remotely when this was done, that might have been enough to reassure the patient that somebody higher up the tree, um, you know, an ophthalmologist had looked at this and, and and agreed that it didn't need further intervention at that point, and the advice to give. Um, so just a sort of more general point to everybody: be aware of what your local protocols are with regards to teleophthalmology and get signed up to them because um, for these borderline cases where do you don't you refer teleophthalmology can be a saving grace. It can allow you to either sleep at night because you didn't refer or sleep at night because you did. Absolutely. And I do apologize to the audience members. I've, I've banded the word ochroplasmin and didn't actually make it clear what it was. So it's a new drug that we've had over the last three <clears> to four years and you inject it into the eye and it has a specific enzyme that cleaves between the hyaluronic face and the retina. So it actually induces a vitreous detachment. And then if you induce a vitreous detachment, in that bottom where the adhesion is at the bottom of that picture it can either cause a nice separation and resolution of that foveal elevation or um, the, it can pull it even further and cause that fovea to, to tear and you get a macular hole but that's not a bad uh, scenario as well because you can rescue that very well with a vitrectomy because you've already separated the hyaloid it makes it easy for the surgeon to get the vitreous out and um, they can still get a good a good result. And we've got to realize, yes, I've converted a vitreous macular traction into a, a macular hole through the use of ochroplasmin, but that's the natural history anyway. Vitreous macular traction syndrome can progress to a macular hole. That's the kind of process and, and how macular holes form in the first place. You've just maybe accelerated it a little bit, that natural history. Yeah, cool. Right, um, I think it's probably time to bring Tim back in and uh, it's 25 past uh, 25 past seven so apologies we've not left a huge amount of time for questions I'm happy to hang around a little while longer if if there are questions and people want them answering but uh, over to you Tim. Thank you very much Mark and, and thank you too Fard um, I think I speak oh, on pleasure. behalf of everyone who's joined us this evening it was a really fantastic um, just that back and forward chit chat with you guys is so valuable because um, as one of the uh, background organisers and, and chair of this meeting, it is such a challenge to try and answer all these questions. But as I'm trying to answer some of them, you guys are answering them as you go along anyway. So that's, I think that's one of the things that's been really great about this session. Um, but Mark, as you say,
we're right in the last five minutes now so i do have a ton of questions so i've tried to pick some of the best ones out which i think will um, benefit most of the audience but by all means you are welcome to hang about mark and father are kindly going to stay a little bit longer after the uh, the deadline of 7 30 so you're welcome to hang around and and, and listen to a few more questions and um, but we totally understand if you need to go and if you do need to go don't worry you will still get your interactive CET point for this session. So guys, I'm just going to kick off with uh, the top of my pile, really. I've got a question here from Bill Harvey. Hello, Bill. I'm sure many of you know Bill very well. Um, and he asks, after the recent, recent study out of Cardiff, there may well be a point soon where suitably trained optometr optometrists may undertake the CVI process. Is this something we all approve of? At the end of the day, if it's validated and they've had the skill set and the experience and they've got the clinical expertise, um, I can't see any issue or any resistance within the ophthalmology community uh, to having registration because then it, it saves that patient a, a journey. And, you know, we'll be seeing patients in our care who are going to want to register blind or partially sighted, you know, whilst as part of their ongoing care. But yes, I think the more we can empower our community optometrists who have the experience and the expertise and the competence to do that, um, I think that's very welcome. And I wasn't yeah. aware of that. So that's excellent news. Yeah. And I think it's, it's so important now, far, is not it? It's the big question everyone's asking, really, is I, I often hear this in a lot of the ophthalmology webinars now is about this silence before the tsunami of patients following the, the COVID lockdown. And, and obviously that's going to that's already happening some some practices are opening up already isn't it mark so yeah i think it's a, a really important question okay is dry amd acceptable to be managed in the community practice even if it's very advanced i'll let mark first answer and then i'll i'll, I'll answer after um I, I would say as long as you feel that your practice is practicing within your limitations and your, your skill set and competence then absolutely. Um, I, I don't, apart from registration, which we've just sort of discussed a little bit more anyway, um, I don't see that the hospital can really do anything else that we can do. It's about, um, you know, it's about reassurance that they're not going to lose peripheral vision. Hopefully they don't have glaucoma too. But it's about, you know, reassuring they're going to have peripheral vision, giving them some skill sets, you know, some tips and tricks to, to, to cope and to manage with the vision that they've got. If you happen to be a low vision practitioner as well, or you, you have access to a low vision practitioner, then obviously you could do a, a referral to there or, or to, to other site services. I, I don't necessarily see that we need to be uh, gumming up the hospital with, with, with dry AMD, as long as we're fairly certain that that's what it is. And as long as the patient is happy for us to manage in community. Nothing to add to that answer. Thank you, Mark. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Um, a question for you, Fard, from Lorraine Knight. Um, what happens to a patient referred in with CSR so that I can advise the patient better? Mm -hmm. I've seen a few of these cases recently. Thank you. Now, again, this is a very interesting one, which I think maybe slightly relates to COVID. And I'd, I'd like to hear your, your opinion, both your opinions on that, actually, because I've heard some people suggesting that there's more CSRs related to the stress of everything that's going on. Do you do you think that's even a thing? Or? I wouldn't know because we, we, we're not seeing them. They're not coming to hospital as they used to be. So there's a lot of pathology that's affecting sight that patients are not vocalizing. So I've certainly not seen a CSR for a long time during this particular lockdown. But imagine we're outside of COVID. What would happen is that patient would come to clinic. I would examine them, take the history, identify if there's any stressful event what their alcohol intake is like, or are they taking any exogenous steroids like topical, inhaled, or oral. Examine the eye, make sure there's no ocular inflammation, no anterior uveitis, no vitritis. If I'm happy, then obviously I've identified the neurosensory detachment, make sure there's no macular hemorrhage, no retinal vasculitis, or anything like that. And then I can be reassured this is a CSR. I'll then request imaging, and they'll get a, a, a standard OCT 
with an enhanced depth imaging OCT. So that's a normal OCT where you've done something to the light physics of the scanner, which means that the detector in the OCT um, prefer, prefers to image the choroid over the retina. So you're getting a much more detailed image of the choroid, so much so that you can identify the thickness of that choroid. And often in patients with unilateral CSR, you'll find the choroid is thicker in that eye than the other eye. Why am I giving you all this information? It's because I want to be confident this is CSR and not something that's masquerading as CSR. Once I'm confident it's CSR, I'll have that discussion with the patient if they're, if they're not sleeping well or they're stressed about something or they're drinking too much, whatever try and get some lifestyle changes, or if they're on steroids, see if we can stop them, if it's safe to do so. And then I might start them on a period of observation for six to eight weeks. See them again, if they're improving and their vision's improving, I may then see them another eight to six, weeks, six to eight weeks later. If it's clear that actually things are getting worse or their vision is declining, it's only at that point I consider a fluorescein angiogram. And that's really to identify the area of leakage. So then I can direct my team uh, to do what we call reduced fluence photodynamic therapy. So photodynamic therapy is that light sensitive dye that we inject through the vein. We used to use it for AMD, but now it's, it's, it's futile for AMD, but very effective in CSR. But we use half of the light energy we used to use for AMD. So it's called half fluence. So it's very effective, but it doesn't um, cause as much damage. But there's no role for any medical treatment. So you may have been aware that there was some case series describing epirelinone and spironolactone, which are mineralocorticoid antagonists, which may have had a role in resolving CSR. And um, up until a year ago, I was offering it in some of my patients where the CCG would not provide PDT. However, there's a UK trial called the Vici trial, which has showed no benefit. So at the moment, you need to still refer CSR to hospital. I like Mark's comments earlier, a patient with subretinal fluid needs to be referred to hospital for a diagnosis. And then once you think it's CSR, it's an observation. But if we treat them, the definitive is photodynamic therapy, which is light sensitive. So for a day or two, they're going to have to wear a dark hat, a dark pair of glasses, some dark sunglasses, wear some gloves, and stay out of direct sunlight for a couple of days after treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Um, I've got quite a few people asking a similar question, guys, actually, and it's a question to both of you um, again. Um, how do, what's the communication strategy between Mark and you, Fard? When you have a patient you want to refer, Mark, what channels do you use to communicate with Fard? Um, <laughs> because I'm... Um... As I said at the outset, FARD works at the Royal Hallamshire and I, most of my patients end up because of GP location going to Chesterfield Royal. So when they go there, it would either be just a standard referral posted or if it was a, a more urgent situation, it would be an NA test on an email to the triage team with attachments sent. Um, at the Hallamshire, they do have uh, the medical retina team as well and you can uh, again, email with it with, with high quality images there. S some of the patients that Fard and I deal with are dealt with on a private basis. Um, so we're, we're monitoring between us at least a couple, are we not, Fard, of, of, of more peripheral CSRs where the work's been undertaken and the patients are just returning to me again with, with a clear direction from Fard as to when to send back. Um, but m depending on what it is, if it needs an image, then I think email is the best way to go because you can you can attach a high resolution image. Bef when, a while ago, it was quite difficult with the with the NHS to get access to NHS.net emails, and thankfully that seems to have turned the tide. And at one point, I was taking high resolution cross sectional scans with a spectralis, printing them out on to, on like a bubble jet printer, and then faxing them down a fax line. I mean, Lord knows what they look like at the other end of the at the other end of the scene. And and in this day and age, that's just farcical. We, you know, let's just generate a high resolution JPEG or PDF um, of the scan, the the, the 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 spectralis, and I'm sure other other OCT platforms can do the same. Generate generate high as high resolution images as you possibly can, covering the worst sections of the area affected, and get those over on an email. The other thing that I would say is don't always assume that an email's been picked up. 
and we so we will send an email and then I will then get my front of house team to to chase and phone up the who, wherever I've sent it to to say have you got the email have the images come through can you see them can you download them and then we record that on the patient record so we record it's been sent and we record that it's been received but email wherever possible occasionally no. if I'm sending the patient direct to hospital then obviously you've got the option of, of printing you know if I've spoken to a triage team and they've said right we've got an appointment in an hour send them in which does sometimes happen um, then I can print relatively high resolution and that we've now got a color laser jet and uh, just take send them with the patient and take them with them yeah I, th I think again that's um that's one of the weird kind of silver linings in this situation we've been going through is it's it's forced technology forward hasn't it um i need, and i know fard when we've talked before you're doing a lot of um your uh, tele ophthalmology consultations via various different video conference tools aren't you to speak and see your patients and i, I hear this from ophthalmologists all around the country and thankfully hopefully we'll see the end of this almost 1980s tech of fax machines and things like this they've got to go because we, we're in a digital world now as we know aren't we so yeah hopefully i think um, i think, I think the holy grail for me but i don't see it coming anytime soon particularly with the spectralis given that at the hallam sharam at chesterfield Royal, both those hospitals have spectralis units the holy grail would be to download what's called an eps file which is basically the entire patient file and then the hospital or the triaging service can just upload that data file and it's as if they've captured the file the, the data on their machine which is great because if they subsequently take over the patient's care they've got my baseline reading as number one and then theirs become follow-ups rather than resetting a baseline and then at the point of discharge and this is real holy holy grail would be if we got an eps file back to download into ours to say this was the final appointment at the hospital this is what it looks like when the ophthalmologist was happy with the patient and discharged. This is your new baseline. Only send back if it changes from that within these parameters. But hey, we've got NHS.net for now, so at least we can send high resolution. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's not get uh, too carried away. <laughs> that's that's the dream. One day, that's ophthalmology Valhalla. One day, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. And I, I, th I think it. I think it is. I, don't, I mean, I think it's a. It's a good dream, and I think it's realistic, and we we can do it. It's just making sure that everyone is on the same. Uh, we're all on the same mantra, and all all, all in the same direction. And it, it just needs government. It needs government to strategize how they want the eye service for 2020 and for moving forward to be for the UK public. And I think we can we can really lead and show the world how to do it well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I mean, with the network of the NHS, we've got all the the components there, haven't we? It's just frustrating yeah. the strings it's that attach to the components that we need to all work together to 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 create. Guys, um, thank you so much. I won't keep any more of your precious time this evening. Um, but again, on behalf of everyone who's joined, thank you. Um, but thank you from us as well for all of you um, staying right till the end. We've still got some great numbers here, even though we've, we've gone a good 10 minutes over the edge. So it's really great that you've all stuck around to, to hear uh, Mark and Fard answers to your questions and our chat. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone for, for joining. Um, if you may, if you're still here and you look at your um, go to webinar menu bar, you'll notice there is actually a handout attached to this session this evening. And that's this great um, um, academy layer thing. I've got a, an image of it here. So that's a, a PDF you can download, which is a nice thing to have like near you. If you have an OCT machine, near your OCT machine, it's just our diagram of all the retinal layers, which is, of course, essential for any of you that are still new or are considering OCT going forwards. So you can download, download that right here, if you can still click on that. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna end the evening with a thank you very much once again to uh, thank Mark and Fard. Thanks guys. And uh, we'll thank keep you. an eye on our website. If you're subscribed to our newsletter, that's the best place for all the information of upcoming webinars, but please, any ideas, any more feedback about how, we, how this evening's gone, we really appreciate anything you say. And we'd look forward to um, putting more on for, for all of you guys for joining us. So thanks once again. Yes. Now everyone stay safe.